So on this topic on advanced uh, ECG gating or 4D CTA, if you if you wish, we'll talk uh, about the uh, four brief uh, uh, topics. Won't be just addressing the the technical background, just very briefly, not in in depth, but just to remind everybody what we're talking about when we're using 4D CTA uh, based on ECG gating. Then I'll show three examples or blocks of examples of how we really use it. Most of the time I'm aware this turns out to be really useful. One is in the setting of acute aortic dissection, then one is in preoperative imaging, particularly before aortic valve replacement or any uh, um, structural heart uh, imaging, and then also for post-operative imaging like in uh, post-stent graft or post-surgical uh, imaging in general. Now for technical considerations, when you think about what's in ECG gated CT of the thoracic aorta, or how we usually call it, a gated chest. Essentially, it's uh, best or easiest to compare it to a coronary CT angio, whereas in a coronary CT angio, uh, you usually just uh, focus on the heart, so you don't need to entire the entire chest, and you try to get the thinnest collimation uh, possible, like 0.75 millimeters. You don't need to do this necessarily with uh, with a gated chest, so but you do want to wish you wish to uh, image the entire uh, chest because you usually want to see the thoracic aorta and its branches, but it doesn't have to be the thinnest collimation. So one millimeter or a little bit larger may in fact be enough for some of the indications. Another difference is that for a gated chest, we always uh, use uh, at least ten phases uh, of reconstruction, like zero to ninety percent, uh, whereas for uh, coronary CT, at least theoretically, you don't need to do this. So in coronary CT, if you have one really good still phase, uh, typically in mid, uh, mid diastole at 70% of the R interval, that's enough. So you don't have to have a 4D data set to read a coronary CT angiogram. So a good static images will do. Now, when you, uh, the reason why we want to have 10 phases or at least a good systolic and diastolic image is because some of the findings that we expect to see in patients uh, uh, where we do these exams are usually seen in only one or the other phase and sometimes even the dynamic is important. So you have an example of a patient who had a, a ROS procedure which is like a, a, a certain aortic root uh, repair and you can see in diastole you see a small possible leak here, a little bit of contrast outside of the aortic root, but in systole you see that this uh, uh, little space becomes much bigger. And uh, if you see it even better on uh, 3D or on a, on a dynamic image, you can see how these uh, balloons here, this little leak, and then which usually tells you also where the lesion comes from, because if the lesion comes from the left ventricle, so which under the valve plane, it usually does that. It balloons back and forth because the pressure difference between systole and diastole is very large if it's connected to the ventricle, whereas if it was connected to the aorta, the pressure difference is not that large. So this already suggests that it comes from the LVOT or from the left ventricular outflow tract. And then when you look at it in 3D, you can actually see here this is a little leak that you can see and it connects really to the left ventricle rather than to the aorta. So you need to see these things uh, in uh, sometimes in a dynamic fashion, but uh, particularly or always you need to see it at least in systole and diastole. So well, on a coronary CT you really can try to reduce the dose as much as possible. You can use prospective gating or retrospective gating with mean dose, really reducing the dose. For a gated chest, you usually have to uh, widen the ECG pulse window uh, setting a little bit in order to get systole and diastole. And the reason is simply if you're if you're using a Mindos protocol or when you reduce your um, your max MA uh, in parallel with the ECG, you can get quite noisy images. So if your images are too noisy during the phase when you really want to see something, then it doesn't really help you. So if you have a systolic image and you want to get information in systole, let's say for a TAVA planning, then it doesn't help you if you have a low uh, dose or too much noise uh, during that particular phase of the cardiac cycle. So usually what we do in this situation, so this is a cartoon where you show the, the dose modulation relative to the RR interval. So for gated chests, we usually expose at full dose between 30 to 70 percent of the uh, RR interval but we down modulate to 20%. We usually do not down modulate all the way to uh, 4% as we would do in the Mindos protocol. 
You can reduce only to only 70% again, but only down moderately 20%, not not less than that. So it still results in, I would say, quite remarkable images. So this is uh, if you down moderately to 20% during systole, you can still see that during diastole the images are sharper, but I have no doubt to see how the valve opens and closes. And you see clearly how the valve is thickened here, and you can also see that the valve doesn't co so there's a little co defect in the center of the valve, which will allow blood to run back into the left ventricle during diastole. Do you have a, a, a three-chamber reform of that? And what uh, you can see here again is that the valve doesn't completely close in diastole. So once the ventricle pumps blood out in diastole, it, it unfortunately comes back, which explains why the left ventricle is relatively large. So it's really volume overloaded because of all the contrast that comes back from the aorta during the diastole when it, in fact, uh, uh, shouldn't do that. So in general, the the gating principles that you, you could use. What we are currently discussing is a, a true 4D acquisition with retrospective gating 30 to 70 percent, uh, and usually reconstructing 10 phases. I think we're reconstructing more than 10 phases uh, for some indications, and we will probably do this more frequently in the future, as opposed to a typical 3D gated acquisition or at least a motion suppressed acquisition. So you can use also a flash mode and uh, the min dose or something like this for the entire order if you want to reduce the dose, which can be, is probably appropriate if you have just a standard surveillance where you just want to look how the order uh, looks in its outer diameter for a typical surveillance. Now, uh, how do we use it uh, in a QT aortic dissection? And I think uh, it's a nice example is this patient who has a type A dissection. You can see this, the, the dissection flap in the ascending order, how it's being whipped around uh, by the cardiac cycle, by the bloodstream, which is um, not necessary to make the diagnosis, I would argue, because uh, if you just see any of these flaps in the ascending order, you made the diagnosis that it's a type A dissection. But it, it's kind of helpful to explain why the blood pressure difference uh, in the patient is just so, uh, so high. It's a systolic of 170 over 20 dia in diastole, so it's somehow explained by that the, the, the lumen completely collapses in this particular patient, and so the diastolic pressure never really uh, comes up. So this explains some of these uh, phenomena when you see uh, uh, a gated study and when you reconstruct it in 10 phases. It gives you just a better understanding of how much is really going on in this uh, particular uh, situation. Another example where it's really helpful is in this patient, also a patient who had uh, kind of somewhat, somewhat atypical symptoms, uh, but on uh, transthoracic echocardiography, they suspected a type A dissection, but they weren't really sure something was uh, awkward looking. And then you look at the CT scan, you can see some linear filling defect here at the aortic root, some ditzel here in the ascending aorta, which you can't really make sense of if you have just this image here and clearly a dissection flap more distally in the ascending aorta and in the arch and in the descending aorta. But this finding is a bit unusual because you wonder, are you cutting here through the aortic valve or there's a flap? And if it's a flap here, why don't we have a flap here? And then we have a flap here again. So it kind of doesn't really make sense if you look at it just on these uh, axial images. But if you have a 3D image, then you can suddenly clearly uh, identify what happens because you see the dissection flap is here descending uh, arch in the ascending aorta, and the remainder of the flap that should connect here is in fact right here, and you see it prolapses to the valve plane. So this is a dissection flap, and again it's uh, uh, much better to see on 3D than it is on 2D images, but I would argue it's even better seen if you see it in 4D, because now you can in fact see that this huge flap that moves up, up and down is truly a dissection flap. This is the tissue that originally connected to this part of the dissection flap. And it's not the valve because the aortic valve is right here. You can see the aortic valve here. This is a dissection flap. And the, again, to make a diagnosis, it may not be relevant. Uh, and you can make it probably without those images, but uh, it explains what's going on. And you can tell the surgeon, and for that they are particularly grateful, uh, exactly where the dissection flap begins relative to the left main coronary artery, also to the right coronary artery, because that really helps them plan their procedure and anticipate how complex the repair is. So if they have to repair only the ascending aorta, or if they have to go all the way down to the root and even deal with the valve, which is a, a, a completely different uh, procedure 
uh, 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 to, to do. Now, another complicated uh, case where uh, the 4D acquisition was particularly helpful. This was a, uh, a, uh, a patient visiting from the Netherlands. So a 48-year-old year old man, he was visiting with his husband. So they were first traveling to Los Angeles where he had chest pain. He had um, uh, a workup for a myocardial infarction. So they tested his troponin. The stress equity was negative. So he did not have a myocardial infarction. So they continued their trip. Ten days later, they ended up in Palo Alto and at dinner. He again had severe chest pain, and now he came to the ED and he had signs of ischemia in his uh, ECG. And uh, obviously with that history and with that uh, suspicion of having an acute MI, they, uh, they rushed him to the cath lab. And uh, here you can see already the, the, uh, the catheter uh, in place, uh, trying to inject into the left main coronary artery. And uh, it's a, one of the more scary pictures for any of the interventional cardiology fellows who started doing this because you expect a coronary artery to fill here, but nothing fills. You just see a stump. So the fellow just looked across the uh, uh, across the, um, the, the separation line and looked if the patient was even alive with no coronary artery on the left, but the heart, as you can see, is still beating, and the patient was still doing fine. So you wonder what's going on there. And so they took the patient once they thought that maybe the patient has an aortic abnormality, took uh, the patient to the CT scanner. And what you can see here is that the patient, in fact, has an aortic dissection. But not only do you see a dissection flap here in the ascending aorta, you also see that the flap goes all the way down here to the aortic root, right to where the, where the uh, right corner artery is. And you see another flap. It's right here where the left, the main corner artery takes off. So that's the problem uh, why it wasn't filled. But the corner is filled. We do, just don't understand from the angio where they are filling from. But if you do a reformat, you can see the, uh, the classic dissection. So there's a dissection flap. Here's a primary intima tear. This is false lumen. This is true lumen. But the unusual thing about this patient is that he has a separate tear of the aortic wall right here. with a separate partial tear. And you see this uh, flap that completely occludes the left main uh, coronary artery. And that's this empty pocket where the, where the fellow put the catheter tip. So he injected into this thing, which is a blind ending uh, uh, portion of this second flap, but the, uh, which occludes here the left main coronary artery. But when you look at other phases, so in diastole it looked occluded, but in systole actually it opens up. So again, here's a coronary artery. In systole this little pocket opens up like a lateral to it. So the patient has severe ischemia. There's very little blood or hardly enough blood trickling down the left main coronary artery. It's just enough to keep the patient alive and let the, uh, the blood supply the myocardium so it doesn't die but this obviously results in severe ischemia. And the other thing you can do, since we have a 4D gated data set, you can also reconstruct uh, images of the heart. And what's the, uh, the hallmark that you see in this patient is a short axis. You see this part of the uh, arterial of the myocardium does in fact actually not really contract. You see a normal heart muscle comes in when the heart beats and it should thicken. And you see this entire wall here not only does it not thicken, but it also doesn't come in. And you can see a, a, a mild sub-endocardial zone of low attenuation here. This is because this is severely underperfused. That's a uh, case of severe ischemia caused by a dissection flap going into the left uh, main coronary artery. Now, interestingly enough, this patient survived very well. He was operated on, and he actually never developed a myocardial infarction, so he never developed a troponin. So this was severe ischemia. But fortunately for him, he never had a myocardial infarction. Another example which uh, shows uh, probably the most important reason why we do gated studies for uh, a patient with suspected uh, dissection. And I won't go into any details, but what I want you to point out here is that the patient uh, here has a little wall irregularity in the ascending aorta. This is done on a non-gated uh, CT from an uh, outside study. And uh, the patient who had a, uh, also initially a, uh, suspected uh, uh, MI, but then they saw a dilated aorta. And this little wall irregularity, again, it's very hard to make a three-dimensional mental picture of what's really going on here. And again, it is much, much easier to identify if you have a high-quality CT scan, because what you see here is that the patient has, in fact, a huge tear in the aorta. So this is like a 180-degree uh, partial thickness tear the aorta. It goes all the way from from uh, from here to here, and uh, the 
the remainder of the aortic wall bulges out. So here's a surgical correlation. So this is the portion of the wall uh, that bulges out here, corresponding to that part here. And then you have also the path specimen here. So after the patient went to surgery, so you can see that this is in fact a tear. So here the 4D is not important, but the, the suppression of motion is critical to identify subtle lesions like that. So this has been is a, a variant of aortic dissection. This is called a limited intima tear of the aorta. And you can uh, read more of that in uh, one of these uh, papers that uh, uh, came out uh, uh, last year with some more examples of that as well. Now another, uh, I would say, one of the most important indications for using uh, uh, 4D uh, treatment planning or imaging of these patients with aortic disease is uh, before uh, thoracic aortic surgery, but also, in fact, for uh, uh, percutaneous interventions like TAVR or mitral valve replacement. And again, the, uh, in addition, or the first advantage of using gating is that you get rid of motion artifacts. So just look at these images. This is a, a, a Marfan's patient where the goal of imaging is to compare uh, if the size of the aortic root increases over time. A normal aortic root is four centimeters. So uh, if it's more than four, we really need to see if it grows. And uh, if you look at the artifacts, it's really hard to come down on a number and be sure if the aorta grows one millimeter or two or three millimeter when the artifact alone is like five millimeter. But if you have a gated study, I think your, your confidence in making an accurate measurement is for sure much uh, higher. In addition, uh, if you have uh, a 4D data set, it explains some of the other findings in this patient. So this patient has a root aneurysm, and you wonder that, uh, that the, you can see that the aortic valve again doesn't close, so which again is a co-optation defect, and you wonder, well, uh, the, uh, why do we even need to know this? Uh, it, apparently the valve is uh, really diseased, so there's nothing we can do. We have to replace the patient's aortic root, and we have to uh, replace the patient's aortic valve, but it turns out that uh, when you think about the reason why the aortic valve is not working is not because the valve is diseased. The reason is because the valve is kind of mounted in a big aneurysm. So if you could put the valve back into a smaller ascending aorta, then the valve would probably use, would, would probably work perfectly fine. And that's uh, why we do these images to plan what's called a valve sparing aortic root repair, where the surgeons replace the aneurysm aortic, uh, aortic root, but they still leave the valve in place and mount the valve back uh, into the uh, patient's uh, graft. So you see how this looks intraoperatively. So here you see the aortic valve when it's kind of a, a collapsed because there's obviously no pressure. Uh, here you see the, the ostium of the coronary arteries uh, before it gets re-implanted on the outside of the graft. All these little uh, green lines here are the suture lines that are mounted. You can see it here actually below the valve plane. And along all these uh, suture lines, they're going to parachute down the graft. So it's then mounted around the valve. And then they kind of replant the valve on the inside of that graft. And in order to do this, you need to know how big of a graft you want to pick because uh, the graft material uh, determines uh, what kind of valve or how big of a valve you can uh, mount into that graft. So you see post-operatively how it looks. There's a larger graft or the root where the valve is mounted, the corner is plugged in, is the ascending aorta, and up here is the aortic arch. And the reason, again, is uh, uh, you need to be able to measure how long the aortic leaflets are because the size of the leaflets determines how big your graft should be in order to accommodate uh, your, your uh, valve uh, preoperatively. And so they neck down the graft proximally, and this is what they're ultimately going to be uh, connecting to the LVOT. Now, uh, another typical preoperative imaging uh, uh, scenario is, uh, is TAVR, or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So we discussed this a little bit uh, today. But again, the point that I want to make is or the reason why we need a gated chest and uh, a non-gated abdomen pelvis for excess vessel uh, uh, evaluation is that if you want to measure the aortic annulus to determine how big the prosthetic valve is that you put in, you can only measure this 
when you have a gated study and you have to capture the systole, the systolic phase, because during systole, that's when the aortic valve is at it, its, uh, where the annulus is at its widest dimension. If you measure the aortic annulus during diastole and the annulus is smaller, then you may use a too small valve to put it in, and then the valve is not really secured and may actually fall back in the ventricle, which is a big problem. So the main reason why we need gating is, first of all, uh, to measure, to do an accurate measurement, which has to be done in systole, but it's also to determine if the patient has a bicuspid or a three commissural valve. This is an example of a patient with a bicuspid valve. You can see there's one leaflet here and a combined larger leaflet here. So a bicuspid valve is uh, usually a surgical uh, option only, except in some circumstances, but no matter what, the surgeons or the interventional cardiologists re really need to know if it's bicuspid or a three commissural valve. And unless you have see the valve open and close, you just cannot tell. So on a single uh, non-gated study, it would, would be impossible. On a 3D in diastole, it would also not be possible. So really see, need to see the valve beat and make beat in order to make this, uh, this distinction. And again, the measurements are really the, the, uh, the most important part uh, to plan for a percutaneous aortic valve, and this is always done in systole or whenever we find that the annulus is at its largest. And again, many other many other me measurements are done as well, but again, it's the systolic measurement of the annulus which is really the most important part. Now, the uh, uh, you may have seen a few patients that are already evaluated for pre-transcatheter mitral valve replacement, but even more complicated, the uh, planning is uh, more sophisticated and difficult, but the principle is the same. You need to have a very high quality study, and here we usually scan them in 20 phases over the cardiac cycle. This is a patient who also has a, or the aortic valve is here, as you uh, know already from, from the tower, and the mitral valve is here, so this anterior mitral leaflet should open like a gate, right? But it doesn't, you see, it's totally stuck, and the opening of the valve is really, really tiny. So this is where the valve opens. It's a very tiny little uh, uh, slot here. So a severe mitral valve stenosis. And again, this needs a way more sophisticated planning because if the devices are more complicated. You have to prevent, you have to make sure that the valve fits into the mitral valve and also that it doesn't occlude the left ventricular outflow tract. And you'll see for sure more of that. And again, this requires a gated study. And this usually requires 20 phases and a very sophisticated uh, protocol. Now, post-operative imaging, again, very important. Uh, again, for continued surveillance, surveillance, you might argue that a 3D may be enough, but for pre-discharge, so after the patient underwent the procedure, you really want to see a 4D to make sure that you don't miss anything. Now, here's a patient, uh, very complex, uh, but it shows the power of 4D imaging. Oops. So this patient had a, uh, a remote history of an aortic valve replacement, uh, you can see this little metal artifact is from the patient's uh, 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 aortic valve here that you can, uh, the biopro bioprosthetic aortic valve. This is just the uh, metal ring here. And then you can see here uh, the post contrast scan. You see a little leak already here, just <coughs> next to where the suture ring is. But that's something we usually uh, want to uh, avoid. And then here you see uh, already much better uh, the problem. So here we're looking at the aortic valve. This is a mechanical aortic valve, actually. Uh, I misspoke before. And uh, where you can see the valve closed here uh, in diastole and in systole, the, the valve opens. But the problem is that you see all these, these little outpouchings here near the, uh, near the aortic root, near the suture line. And so the question is again, does this come from below the valve or above the valve plate again, so does it connect to the ventricle or not? And here you can uh, see how these little outpouchings look, but it uh, really requires a 4D image to see if they change in size, if they pulsate, to make the distinction uh, between uh, subannular or uh, supravalvular uh, uh, leak. In addition, what uh, is kind of uh, interesting to see is there's a little bit of a contrast uh, kind of uh, coming out of this region here, which I would say I would never have picked it up on this static image. I'm just showing it you afterwards, after, after the effect. But what actually happened in this patient is you can see here, first of all, that there are a lot of these lesions pulsate, so it means they have communications with the LVOT. Then you this, this thing here, this outpouching, you see there's a jet coming out of the aorta, uh, 
over the only in Sicily, uh, which is a, a kind of a, a scary looking. And the reason what is happening here is that the that the again you see the pulsating of these leaks that the contrast that comes out of the aortic root here uh, goes into the RVOT, so it ends up in the pulmonary artery. And again, you wonder how is it even possible, and the, it's possible because the patient had a history of an of a VSD, so a little communication between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, and it was treated with a patch, and there's a small leak in that patch. But to see this on a static image, I would argue, is virtually impossible. Again, showing you that the 4D acquisition really adds a lot of information that you would uh, otherwise uh, miss. Another patient, so it's about, about as complicated as this can get. So this patient uh, had a, uh, a remote history of a type A dissection, which was repaired with an ascending aortic graft, a total arch repair, and an elephant trunk. So here's just what this means. This means that the aorta is replaced with a graft all the way from the proximal ascending aorta uh, to the arch, then an elephant trunk, which means is a part of that graft uh, extends into the uh, proximal descending thoracic aorta. What the surgeons did next is they put a stent graft, which is all this metal uh, mesh here, from that graft all the way down to the uh, diaphragm to this level. So usually what you would hope is that the false lumen aneurysm that you see around here, that this starts to thrombose and disappear. This is the reason why all these procedures have been done. Now the patient has been following uh, over some time and this chronic false lumen never disappeared. It was still perfused and so the question is really how does blood still get into that false lumen? So when you look at all these images and you kind of uh, try to wrap your head around it, we looked here at the level of the renal artery, you see here the renal artery, and we saw at this level maybe there's a tiny communication between the true lumen, which is like the brighter one, and the false lumen, the lesson. So maybe the blood comes from here and fills the false lumen here. So then you would think, well, maybe we should plug this somehow, and that would help. Then looking even closer, you see, oh no, there's another leak. Look here, the stent graft ends right here, and then you see a little bit of contrast that comes from the true lumen into the false lumen. Well, maybe we should just extend the stent graft and cover that lumen. That should solve the problem. But then when you look at it in 4D, then look at this here. What you can see here is that in systole, contrast does in fact jet from the true lumen into the false lumen, but you can see it in diastole, the non-opacified blood actually flows back, and the diastolic phase is in fact much longer than the systolic phase, so what it means is that there's in fact more blood flowing from here to the true lumen than in the other direction, so if you would plug this hole, it should increase the pressure in the fourth lumen, which you really want to avoid. So something still doesn't uh, make sense and doesn't add up. Now then, when you look even higher in the patient's uh, thoracic aorta, and you see there's a little bit of a puff right here in this area of the uh, proximal descending thoracic aorta, and only when you look much closer, you wonder, well, where does this tiny little puff of contrast come from? And again, on a static image, you just cannot tell, but the 4D really shows you there is something flowing. And then when you do another 4D and you change the window settings to try to find where it comes from, you can see that the leak is right here. It sees as a view, this is the stent graft here, and this is the left subclavian artery, and here's a little leak. Here's where the little jet comes from. And I would argue that it's impossible to see uh, on a static image, and you really need to see a 4D data set to be able to, to make this out. It can show the, here you see the jet, you can clearly see it comes here from the uh, uh, origin of the left subclavian artery or the anastomosis that has plugged in. So this solves the problem or it at least explains the problem. So there is no hole distally that we need to plug. If you would plug a hole distally it would make it worse. So what we need to do is we need to plug the hole proximally in the first place. And all this information you can only get if you have a 4D uh, information uh, available. So. That's about it. I uh, hope I was able to explain a little bit uh, about the technical considerations that you want to reconstruct 10 phases or 20 phases over the cardiac cycle and uh, uh, you have to use slightly higher dose to not have too noisy images uh, during systole or whenever you want to see uh, the diagnostic images which usually include systole and diastole. Uh, I hope I was able to explain uh, that it helps in aortic dissection to explain some of the abnormal findings 
Although I would argue the main uh, benefit of using gating in uh, aortic or acute aortic dissection is to see or to freeze the motion to see subtle uh, lesions. Uh, Preoperative imaging is really one of the important hallmarks uh, for these uh, uh, gated acquisitions because not only can you plan surgical procedures, but it gets more and more important. And I would say it's a prerequisite for all uh, structural heart diseases, which means transcatheter aortic valve, transcatheter mitral valve, and there's also left atrial appendage clipping and, and devices. So this is going to explode. So all the sites that do coronary now, like uh, Emeryville, uh, Redwood City, SMIC, and maybe South Bay, if we can get the, uh, the revolution also up to speed to do this, this is going to be bread and butter in the near future. There are a lot of patients out there with aortic disease, and there are even more patients out there with mitral disease. And uh, a lot of the surgical colleagues predict that uh, surgical aortic valve replacement will be really a niche uh, treatment in the future. It will be all transcatheter and for mitral valve, probably the same. So this is a lot what we're going to see in the future. And for post-operative imaging, I would argue to see some of these subtle complications, you also need a 4D data set to really guide, uh, to really make sure that there is uh, everything okay and no complications are present. And with this, again, I thank you for your attention. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Blake?